tarot itself is a metaphor for the journey of life, but I realize that the journey in the majority of tarot decks seems to be a male journey, especially in the Solo Busca tarot. But I realized that it depicted what I call the fool hero, which are the epic adventures of misogynic Western literature, while the females were just the allegories for virtues that men who wanted to be leaders were cultivating. Hey everyone, this is Annalisa with Journey to the Goddess TV, where I regenerate ancient feminine wisdom for modern women. Today, I am with the lovely, the fabulous Dr. <laughs> Lisa Skura, <laughs> newly minted Dr. Lisa Skura. Lisa, Thank you. Yeah, she is a cohort member of mine at Pacifica Graduate Institute. And she, just like myself, defended her dissertation a few months ago. So I am excited to have her here to share her wisdom, this work that she has been uh, so diligently and heartingly working on for years on the feminine in the tarot. And it raises the question, one of the main questions that we're going to be circling around today after she gives her presentation is, is the tarot, especially the Solobuska tarot, sexist and we're going to explore the symbols the myths and the archetypes of the feminine in the solo boost katero i just want to remind everybody that if you like our talk today please hit like please leave a comment and please share this video so lisa i'm going to give a quick introduction i know i already kind of gave you a quasi introduction but here's your official introduction. Dr. Lisa Skura is an artist and a mythologist with a PhD from Pacifica Graduate Institute in Carpentria, California. Lisa's various interests also include energy healing, tarot reading, astrology, textile arts, encaustic, pastels, as well as a love of stones and crystals. So Lisa, this is your official welcome to my show. I'm so honored to have you here. Thank you. So before we get into the actual PowerPoint itself, I would like for you to tell us the, tell us your origin story and in terms of what got you interested in reading tarot and specifically, what was your interest in exploring the feminine in the solo busca tarot? So I think I was inspired to take a tarot class after I went to an exhibit at the California Folk Art Museum in Los Angeles in 2010 by Robert Place called The Fool's Journey, The History and Symbolism of the Tarot, which started me on my own journey as I took weekly tarot classes as well as meditation classes. And the meditation teacher happened to be have graduated from Pacifica Graduate Institute, which in turn led me to become a student at Pacifica myself. And in my researching the tarot and the quest for the specifically feminist tarot, I also attended a goddess conference workshop taught by Vicki Noble, the co-creator with Karen Vogel of a round deck called the Mother Peace Tarot. Mm, I love um, the Mother Peace Tarot. Yeah. So I wanted to meet her. And then the tarot itself is a metaphor for the journey of life, which is fascinating to me. But I realized that the journey in the majority of tarot decks seems to be a male journey, especially in the solo busca tarot that has so many male figures and less female figures. And so as I examined it, I realized that it depicted what I call the fool hero, which are the epic adventures of misogynic Western literature. Well, the females were just the allegories for virtues that men who wanted to be leaders were cultivating. Right. And I think it's important here to note that the Sola Busca Tarot is one of the oldest tarot decks that we have in the West. That's complete. We may have, I, I'm not sure, I'm not an expert on this. There are some out there who are historians and et cetera. So it's a whole field in and of itself. But I, I did do a little kind of cursory research and I saw that the one of there's like two Visconti decks or something that may be a little bit older, but we only have partial versions. But I think the main point I want to bring up is that most people I think today are more familiar with the writer weight tarot and the solo busca tarot is similar, but different. 
and some call it the Rider Waite Smith because Pamela Coleman Smith was the illustrator who didn't really get credit. And so that's of course a probably the only woman oh, on that. Yeah, she's right. not the only one. She's not the only tarot artist who didn't really get credit. Also, they know that some black and white drawings of the Solobuska were in the British Museum. And so Pamela Coleman Smith and Waite went to the museum. And so certain cards, like the Three of Swords, are almost identical. So you can go, you can look that up online. It's pretty interesting. You know, the more you look, the deeper it gets. And oh, you know, so. right. Isn't it just like any inquiry? It's like, oh, yes. I, thought I knew this, but it just, you know, you start to go down the rabbit hole with one question. And then you have to say, well, other people have covered this. You know, I had to focus. And I started off with all tarot and all feminist decks and then realized, oh no, I'm going to have to focus. And so the Solobuska came to my attention. And because of the small amount of female images, it became quite interesting to me. Interesting. So before we get into the presentation, I, I, I want to frame our conversation today and your presentation with something that you wrote in your dissertation, which I think is really powerful. And it is this, the Solobuska Tarot is a Renaissance text that undermines female agency and power and perpetuates the falsehoods that females have no place in history and have contributed absolutely nothing to civilization. The female as life, who was revered for tens of thousands of years, was politically suppressed using the propaganda of classical poets and patriarchal religions that still today undermines female power and worthiness. It promotes the notion that the female body and potential should be degraded and sacrificed to empower and elevate men. Male spiritual transcendence is not dependent on female sacrifice, and the propaganda that defines femininity should no longer be used as a trap to shame women into giving away their power in numerous ways, including sexual slavery, free domestic labor and child care, verbal abuse, domestic violence, and the forfeit of female potential. Boom. Page 42. Boom. Page 42 in your dissertation. <laughs> Let's get into the actual presentation now. So the name of my dissertation is The Female Image in the Solobuska Tarot. And I thought I'd start out by just giving you some basic facts about it. It is the most complete 15th century Italian Renaissance tarot, although some suggest 16th century is more accurate. This deck has a total of 78 cards just as a regular tarot deck would have. In the 56 minor arcana are composed of four suits, just as playing cards. But out of uh, 78 cards, only five of the minor arcana depict the female image. And four of these are the queens. And the queens are all numbered 13. The four of discs is Hecate. The major arcana are composed of 22 cards, just as a modern tarot deck. And there are no female images at all in the major arcana. But one card references Medusa. And this card is also numbered 13. Therefore, out of six female image cards, I examine this tarot. Five of them are numbered 13 out of 78 cards. According to Gould Davis, the Christian church branded the number 13 as evil, an ill omen to help suppress the old religions that revered the female divine. So, you know, here we begin to see a pattern of maligning the female image, while at the same time presenting her as a necessary evil that must be controlled or defeated. And this control represented having authority over death and male fate, as well as the appropriation of nature and life-giving powers. And I would say this propaganda is still going on today. So I'll do a little quick explanation of the idea of alchemy in the Renaissance was to be able to create and transform the imperfect base matter of nature into perfection. This was supposedly consists of turning lead into gold or even taking men who come from base matter on their spiritual journey that allowed them to transcend their base natures. But women in the Renaissance were considered to be the epitome of the baseness of the earth and were associated with nature and were considered to be forever trapped in the earth and dominated by men because of the same flawed nature. And although men, just as I said, were also created from the earth, the propaganda of the time suggests men were made in the image of a divine male, God, so they can transcend their base nature, which set up this hierarchical structure that continues even today with powerful men who must not be dominated yet are entitled to dominate others with no consequences. 
And this domination over women was justified by imagining women as corrupt, evil, with no soul, but their womb made them a necessary evil. So it's not surprising that the work of the alchemist imitated the cyclical work of nature, used gynecological metaphors, as well as other metaphors that ancient religions used with their divine feminine to represent the various stages of alchemy. So we have four stages of alchemy, as well as seven planets associated with seven metals. And the work of the alchemist would be to heat these various metals and substances together to achieve the desired outcome. This was a secret of art and was purposely intended to confuse the uninitiated. And sometimes metaphors could be used interchangeably from one alchemist to another. So it becomes really confusing. And so I have this chart and it kind of gives you a name of the alchemical stages on the right-hand side. And then I think I, okay, there we go. I missed this chart, sorry. This is the alchemy chart. And then I also created this chart as well as storyboards to help keep track of all the different aspects of the cards that I examine. Though at first I thought the queens just symbolized the cardinal virtues like modern tarot decks. But then I realized that these female images represented the alchemical element of mercury in its various alchemical stages. And this is mostly symbolized by what they're wearing or various other symbols, uh, such as decapitation, which we find in the Katoni 13 card, which I call the Medusa card, that represents the Negretto stage of alchemy. Although mercury is supposed to be an androgynous metal, it was considered to be female, lunar, as well as a watery element, while sulfur was associated with the masculine and sun and fire element. So this deck starts really is so complicated with many overlapping themes at play, including magic, ancient Greece and Rome, the Trojan War, Alexander the Great in Macedonia, Carthage, as well as other themes. And a great book is The Game of Saturn by Adams, suggests that the Solobuska is a magical text of attack sorcery used by powerful men to attain more power and wealth. This tarot was nicknamed the Ancient Warriors Tarot by tarot historian Giordani Berti, who also I must thank for letting me use his images. And he assured me that the female image was important, but I believe the importance of the female image is only in relation to the attainment of the positive male fates and fortunes. And here we have Hecate, who's the four of discs. She has the moon crown, and in the ancient past, she was an all-powerful goddess. Yet by the Renaissance, she seems to be degraded into being the servant of the Renaissance magician who manipulates her for his own personal gain. She is a stark contrast to the fully dressed queens in this deck that all have little perky breasts and every little hair in place. Adam suggests that the depiction of the female pubic hair is extremely rare before the 18th century. So its appearance here is significant and may be well unique in the art of the Italian Renaissance. She's obese, which could symbolize the female in the spherical shape of the earth. Her face is flushed with the burdens she carries, which are actually the sky, earth, and the underworld. She looks haggard with her hand on her back and her toe extends out over the card, which I thought was interesting. And to me, it, it just suggests she can be easily manipulated and controlled by the alchemist or magician. The womb-like red container she carries has three discs. And if we add the fourth th disc by her genitals, she creates the quaternity of wholeness, as, as uh, Jung would phrase it. And Martin Rulandis in A Lexicon of Alchemy explains, the dominion of the moon in the operations begins when the matter after putrefaction changes its color of gray into that of white. And when the sages speak of their moon in this state, they call it Diana unveiled. And they say that happy is the man who has beheld Diana naked. That is to say, the matter at the perfect white stage. And, you know, Hecate is associated with Diana. Hecate's silver veil suggests the female metal of silver and the stage of albedo, which in the cycle of alchemy, it's a white stage. While at the same time, suggests the veil between the worlds and the circular path of the Kundalini serpent or the Ouroboric serpent that swallows its own tail. But, you know, while I was working on my dissertation toward the end, I just ran across some things. And according to Alan Dundas in Wet and Dry the Evil Eye, an essay, an Indo-European and Semitic worldview, 
he points out that moisture was extremely important in averting the evil eye, and he suggests the male figures with pendulous testes and female figures with protuberant breasts were used to ward off the evil eye, and it can also be stood as liquid bearing symbols. So the large testes and breasts presumably represent an abundance of semen and milk. So we have Hecate who has her pendulous breasts. And then we look at this card, it kind of explains this card where we have the two of wands. So the two of wands, it represents the corresponding male figure with large testes. So, you know, when I read that, it just, woo, it has to do with this other card, which I wasn't even examining that card, but you know, there's just, it just kept leading me to these other cards. So it was interesting, but I had to, you know, consolidate into a dissertation. So, (laughs) and here we have Athena. She has a red robe on her right leg and which made me think this is the leg that she brushed the semen off when Hephaestus tried to rape her and it falls to the earth and impregnates Gaia. The yellow gown uh, suggests the alchemical stage of Saturnitis. And although Athena is the patriarchal daughter, we have the bat wing near her left hand that reminds us she's still a de- demonic pagan goddess. The weapon of Athena was traditionally the spear, yet on this tarot card, she carries the club of strength that's associated with her stepbrother Hercules. And her spear shows up later in the card of Medusa, which suggests the con- connection bet- between the two. And if you look at her hair, she has two locks of hair by her face that twine around each other, mirroring the movement of serpents, which also points to Athena's shadow identity as Medusa. Jane Ellen Harrison proposed that the symbolism of Hercules Club was misunderstood because it is a magical branch from the wild olive tree, a fertility symbol that represents the potential for life rather than a weapon. And so the Club of Hercules derives its power from being the living branch of Athena's olive tree. And Athena's power is the fresh water, because remember, she has a, she fights with Poseidon, and Poseidon has salt, sea water, but she has fresh water, and so she wins. So the fresh water is life, therefore the source of Hercules' strength actually originates from Athena, as a more ancient goddess, probably. And so Athena bestows her blessing of fertility with her left female hand, while she holds the club of strength in her right male hand. Person suggests that in the prehistoric religion of Greece, dormant vegetation was encouraged back to life in the spring by holding and shaking tree boughs during ecstatic dance rituals, which gave men strength. And the queen's crowns, interestingly, all have a seven-pointed spires, which I thought looked like the calyx of the pomegranate or you know, a feminine symbol, which represents the fertility of the land. But the spheres on the ends of the crowns might also hint at the seven planets associated with the metals of alchemy. The crowns and the thrones of the Virgin Queens, Athena and Polycena are both really elaborate. While the other two Queens, Olympias and Helen, thrones there seem to be just merely square stools. And I thought maybe because their usefulness in a patriarchal culture to provide male heirs had ended. And then we have, here's, Helen, uh, queen of discs, she represents the cardinal virtue of prudence, but she's hardly considered hardly prudent. She's dressed all in red, which represents mercury in its volatile and unstable rubido stage of the alchemical process. She's blamed for the Trojan War, and she's considered to be a terrible mother, as well as a whore that becomes the metaphor for a vulgar mercury. In Virgil's Aeneid, Helen of Troy is accused of pretending to lead the women of Troy in Bacchic rites to distract attention from the Trojan horse and protect the Greeks Greeks inside. The wand in her hand identifies her as having not only magical power, but as a maenad of Dionysus or a Bacchante of Bacchus. And these priestesses carried live serpents on their wands or in the ivy crowns over their loose wild hair. But this queen seems to be trying to hide this by tucking in her Dionysian wildness. She's her hair is like perfect in, in contrast to Hecate, whose hair is all sticking out. She tries to play the role, public role of the civilized queen, whose only real power is degraded and found solely in her relationships to male power. And in this card, the vine behind her head suggests 
her more ancient identity as a hanging tree goddess. Martin P. Nelson conjectures that Helen of Troy is thought to originate in the pre-Greek Minoan culture as a much older tree goddess. Adams indicates the rope-like vine behind Helen associates this card with the dendritic Helen, who's hung from a tree by a friend, so-called friend, Queen Polyxo, in revenge for the death of Polyxo's husband in the Trojan War. And she has the red pillar between her legs, which has two items on it. One is silver and one of gold, which suggests the alchemical sacred marriage or the kuniyunktio of the sun and moon. And the silver was considered the female metal associated with moon, dew, and moisture. But the alchemists also associated silver with male semen, which was also a, a watery element. And I just thought it was interesting that the silver pitcher on this card is tilted to the side as if it's about to spill or ejaculate. And then I ran across this Apocalypse of Andrews tapestry, and this is depicting the Whore of Babylon, whose actions mirror the Helen of Troy card, which suggests that Helen of Troy is equated to the Whore of Babylon. And even more interesting is the symbols of the divine feminine in this tapestry, including the mandoral of all the shapes that are in the tree or stars of the sky, I'm not sure. We have the tree of life, and we have the element of water that is going down the stairs, and we have the comb uh, in the mirror of a, a love goddesses of Venus. And here's a closer view of, of this uh, tapestry. So Peter Gray in The Red Goddess suggests the miracles of the undying pagan gods become the attributes of the beast, and the power of the goddess becomes the wanton debauch of Babylon. And then we move on to Queen Polycena, the Queen of Cups, who represents the cardinal virtue of temperance, balance. She also has a masculine pillar of fire between her legs with a sacred vessel of her womb, which suggests her potential to give birth to the divine child. Polycena's body is the purified and perfect matter which is imagined by the alchemist as white metal or stone, AKA the fifth element or quintessence, which was needed to create the divine child, which is also the philosopher's stone. Therefore, she's dressed in the colors of a perfect mother, the Virgin Mary. The mercury created by the alchemist was considered a perfect mother, while the mercury we saw in Helen of Troy was considered to be vulgar. The female seed or mercury was also called argent vive or quicksilver and was also symbolized as a dragon or serpent. And we see in this card that the serpent is emerging from the womb like vessel and stares into her eyes, almost as if to say that she will become the perfect mother in the next card because they're the one in the same card as Olympias who gives birth to the divine child who's a major theme in this deck is Alexander the Great. And Olympia sleeps with Philip II of Macedonia, her husband, as well as a serpent that is Zeus Amon. But other stories say that she slept with the magician Nectanabo. And all three of these father figures are found in this deck. Polycena's dolphin throne on this card might refer to her Nerid sea nymph ancestress Thetis, the mother of Achilles, her male right hand touches the womb vessel, but her female left hand touches the dolphin as if asking for support from the female line of ancestors. She is the priestess of the mystery religion of Dionysus and was said to have handled live snakes, as well as having the herbal knowledge to mix entheogens in her cup to bring about altered consciousness and to unite with Dionysus. And so in my dissertation, I call entheogens, entheogens, adding the A, because rock and other ethnobotanists create this neologism, entheogen, which assumes the divine in plants are all male, even though the divine female was also considered to be found in plants for tens of thousands of years. So that's why I use that. I use entheogen to reverse the assumption that all plants have male divinity inside, yet it still, inc it still includes the males just as they include the females. But anyway, the far more ancient sacred rituals of mystery religions have been suppressed and hidden by subsequent religions. And all three of the queens in this deck, Helen of Troy, Polycena, and Olympias, are all Dionysian priestesses who participated in ritual ingestion of entheogens or mixed it 
which have the potential to create the drug-induced psychosis that were considered either the, a curse of madness or a possession by a god or goddess. Uh, Miriam Dexter suggests this possession by a god was part of the parthenogenic birth rituals, which involved sleeping with a god as a serpent as well as the husband. Therefore, the cup of temperance becomes quite complicated on this card as it represents the womb, the ritual cup of a priestess, as well as the alchemical vessel. And then I noticed, I just kept thinking at looking at her neck, it just seemed so strange to me. I thought it was an attempt to emulate the snake or the dolphin tail behind her. Then I realized that it suggests an apotropaic ritual gesture to the goddess Nemesis. And Elizabeth Reifstahl suggests Nemesis, a deity invented by the Greeks to personify the disapproval of the gods for human presumption, was a goddess to be feared and reconciliated. In earlier Greek art, she is represented infrequently, but always as a woman who sometimes draws out the neck of her garment with one hand like that and lowers her head toward her breast. Perdrizet further elaborates on this gesture, which involved spitting three times on your own breast, as well as touching your right ear. This is notable as spitting to avert the evil eye is found in many cultures. And notice the wheel at the base of Polycena's throne. It doesn't seem to be part of her throne. And so here's a, here's a depiction of Nemesis. And Nemesis is holding a wheel in her hand, and she has her finger hooked on her dress, about to perform the same apotropaic ritual suggested by the contorted neck in the Polycena card. And the goddess Nemesis is also an oceanid, which could be another explanation for the dolphin throne, with Polycena asking for support, not only of her narrated ancestress, but of the oceanid goddess Nemesis. And Polycena, of course, would have been hypervigilantly focused on the success of her womb, because she needed to create a male heir in order to gain power in a polygamous Macedonian court. So she would have needed the good luck offered by Nemesis. And so you see, and the wheel at the base of the throne also suggests the circular work of the alchemist, as well as the goddess Nemesis. And Nemesis also rides in a chariot drawn by griffins. And you see the card of Alexander the Great in this deck not only has wheels, but also has griffins. And so you see there's kind of the association with the goddess Nemesis there also. One of the alchemical vessels that alchemists used was actually called the griffins or gripes egg. And the gripe is a griffin or vulture. And if you think about Maria Gambutas and her work and her association of ancient death goddesses with vultures, it really kind of clicks into place. Although some suggest the Greeks created the goddess Nemesis who's considered to represent justice of Zeus, but it's clear to many scholars that this goddess is far older than Zeus. And so we move on to the next queen, who's Olympias, queen of swords. She is the cardinal virtue of justice. And she, what's interesting is she wears purple and lapis lazuli color, which symbolizes that she attains the philosopher's stone and completes the alchemical process because she has her son, Alexander the Great. She holds the power of the sword in her right hand and the pen and the scribe in her left female left hand. The vine that arches over her head culminates in a seed and her sword crosses the stem of the seed, which can have multiple meanings, such as being the metaphor for Dionysus, the dismembered son who sowed into the earth and remains there till resurrection in the spring. Or it can suggest the alchemist trying to extract the seeds of metal from the prima materia, the base matter needed to create the philosopher's stone. But it's more likely that it hints at the fact that they're implying she's responsible for the ending of the Argeid family line, yet it was Alexander who actually put the family line in jeopardy. According to Elizabeth Carney in her book Olympias, one important aspect of Alexander's early reign was a non-event. He did not marry, did not produce any children before his departure for Asia. Carney also claims that Alexander's inaction allowed Olympias to have greater power in his absence than if he had had a wife before he went on campaign. Carney also suggests that Olympias saves the lives of her son and grandson by engaging in court intrigue and the murder of most of her enemies. And she actually takes another name called Stratonice, which means she's victorious over her enemies 
and she perpetuates the seed of her family. Although Olympias holds a sort of justice, her pen was important to her because she cultivated the relationship with her adult son, Alexander, through her letter writing as he conquered the world. It is interesting in this deck that uh, Olympias is paired with her son, Alexander. She's the queen of swords. He's the king of swords, rather than the other three male figures that are said to have impregnated her. <laughs> Philip's the king of discs. The god Zeus Amon is the knight of swords, and the magician Nectanabo is the knight of cups. Philip II is actually paired with the other bad parent, Helen of Troy, as the king and queen of discs, because Philip threatened to disown Alexander and divorce his mother. Alexander never returns to his mother and dies unexpectedly, and so the sword becomes important to her again as she fights to maintain the throne for her grandson, who's born after he leaves uh, Macedonia. Carney suggests Alexander's use of the sword demonstrates his greatness, while the use of the same sword by Olympias makes her a nasty woman. And historians describe her as meddling, arrogant, headstrong, yet these same historians recognized that she was instrumental in Alexander's rise to power in the first place. And the Machiavellian acquisition of power is what the Renaissance elite desired, but they believed rulership must be balanced with temperance and justice. The virtues symbolized by these two queens, uh, the maiden Polycina and the mother Olympias, who are the same person in this tarot deck. And this is the Catoni 13 card, which shows a male figure holding a banner that says, Trahor Fatis, which according to Adams means, I'm driven by fate, which is a repetitive theme in this deck. The male figure on the card holds a spear that has penetrated the left eye of a male decapitated head, the eye of which represents the eye of the monstrous Medusa, according to Adams, who also claims that the star in the upper right hand corner of this card suggests the astrological influence of a small constellation called Gorgon's Head. The smaller constellation is found in the larger constellation of Perseus in the Gorgon's Head. And Adams suggests, whilst the group of stars that constitute the Gorgon's Head was considered to be purely evil, its main star, Caput Algol, is likened to the most malefic combination of Saturn and Mars imaginable. It is the most unfortunate and dangerous star in the heavens, with a reputation for causing violence and unnatural death. Many consider this card to be the death card in this deck, which makes sense because Medusa symbolizes the alchemical stage of Negretto. The main figure on this card has obviously been successful in suppressing the evil female eye with the spear, and he wears a triumphant laurel wreath of victory around his head. And according to Adams, this star, the star is one of 15 generally used in astral magic, and Perseus was also called upon in traditional magical practice. And we notice the figure of Catoni is dressed all in red, which suggests the volatility of the male active element of sulfur in alchemy, and cutting off the head is the metaphoric symbol that should stop the volatility of alchemical actions. Adams argues that this is the figure of Perseus who has all his shamanic tools depicted, but I don't see all his tools. I see only the helmet of invisibility and the mirrored shield under the head. He's missing the curved sword and he's missing the herb collection bag as well as the winged sandals. But if you look through this deck, you start seeing those symbols on other cards, but I didn't have time to kind of go through the, you know, I was focused, hyper-focused on the female images. So, but it's it just interesting that I found them in other places. Many scholars believe Metis the mother of Athena, who swallowed by Zeus, was part of a triple goddess that includes Athena as well as Medusa. And their splitting symbolizes the defeat of matriarchal tribes of the Amazons, as well as all the Libyan queens. Therefore, when the fool hero Perseus is helped by Athena to decapitate Medusa in her sleep, Athena is actually defeating an aspect of herself. So it's notable that the missing spear of Athena turns up in this card, which alludes again to the connection between the sisters, Athena and Medusa. So for me, you know, the journey of life is for everyone that's alive, not just the male feel fool hero journey, the maligning and erasure of the divine female and women throughout culture, history and religion must be understood as the negative propaganda that it is. 
which still survives in many modern tarot decks. In this production dissertation, my focus was mostly on textile media and the meditative technique of weaving, but I also have some multimedia pieces. And when the female's creator was appropriated by the male god image, the goddess of life and death became the monstrous manipulator of men's fate who must be defeated. One of the major themes in my art is the vagina dentata, the vagina with teeth, an image that erupts from the unconscious in response to the domination and suppression of women and the female divine. I use the vagina dentata image in my art to bring attention to the lingering male fear of female power that's resulted in such inequality for women. The split of the all-powerful goddesses of life and death is either the beneficent nurturing mother or the adversarial and evil devouring mother and are still quite active in the psyche of our Western imagination. The Sola Buscatero's focus is placed on the male images with the worldview that nature, women, and the divine feminine are the enemy rather than at the center of a balanced life, which has resulted in many of the problems we face today, which include the killing of our planet and all its inhabitants. So I'll talk a little about my artwork. So I use the theme of the vagina dentata for much of the artwork in this collection with the intention of returning the sacredness of the divine feminine to our world to counteract the image of the devouring female. So in here is a male scholar in the origins and history of consciousness. Eric Neumann, Neumann de demonstrates how the all-powerful divine female has been carried into modern times as being monstrous rather than sacred and numinous, especially if females cannot be controlled with either violence or magic. And this is a quote, among the symbols of the devouring chasm, we must count the womb in its frightening aspect, the numinous heads of the Gorgon and the Medusa, the woman with beard and phallus, and the male-eating spider. The open womb is the devouring symbol of the Ouroboric mother, especially when connected with phallic symbols. The gnashing mouth of the Medusa with its boar's tusks betray these features most plainly, while the protruding tongue is obviously connected with the phallus. The snapping, i.e. castrating womb, appears as the jaws of hell, and the serpents writhing around the Medusa's head are not personalistic pubic hairs, but aggressive phallic elements characterizing the fearful aspect of the Ouroboric womb. The spider can be classified among this group of symbols, not only because it devours the male after coitus, but because it symbolizes the female in general who spreads nets for the unwary male. This dangerous aspect is much enhanced by the element of weaving as we find it in the weird sisters who spin the thread of life or the norns who weave the web of the world in which every man born of woman is entangled. Finally, we come to the veil of Maya, denounced by male and female alike as illusion, the engulfing void, Pandora's box. Wherever the harmful character of the great mother predominates or is equal to her positive and creative side, and wherever her destructive side, the phallic element, appears together with her fruitful womb, the Ouroboros is still operative in the background. So Neumann's description of the mythical female monster that cannot be controlled places a female divine not only into the underworld, but as the swallower of men. And our Western culture's mythology overwhelmingly encourages the idea of committing violence against the female image to control male fate. In The Fear of Women, Wolfgang Lederer suggests that this violence is intimately associated with the full hero journey which is the tarot journey. And I quote, the breaking of the vaginal teeth by the hero accomplished in the dark hidden depths of the vagina is the exact equivalent of the heroic journey into the underworld and the taming of the toothy hellbound, hellhound Cerberus by Heracles. Darkness, depth, death, and women, they belong together. So the mythic idea of the female is evil monster demon has resulted in not only in justifying violence against all females, but also the vast inequalities that women experience in our culture. The image of the vagina dentata is the result of thousands of years of propaganda against the female who castrates or swallows men. And I believe the use of weaving in my dissertation along with text adds additional relevance 
since in weaving the word, the metaphorics of weaving in female produ textual production, Catherine Sullivan Kruger points out that the textile work is a form of communication used by women, especially in societies that discourage them from speaking or learning to write. Although most women now can read and write, I believe their voices are still suppressed in our culture. And for me, weaving seems to emphasize my suppressed voice. Kruger claims that pictorial textile work communicates some of women's oral history and some myths and legends involving textiles suggest rebellion against involuntary marriages, the struggle between matriarchal and patriarchal religions, and the change of female destiny caused by forced imprisonment and domesticity. And this is a vagina dentata basket. It's made of pine needles. It has a starter hole in the shape of the vulva at the bottom. And for teeth, I used red raffia to hold these vintage pen nibs. And I thought the natural color of the pine needles suggested to me the helicoidal movement of the serpent that's associated with the divine female. And along with like the repeating patterns of the weave contribute to this motion, which seemed meditative as well as suggestive of the serpent. And I would say the vessel of life or the Holy Grail is the uterus that gives birth to the child. And this uterus belongs to the divine female as well as all women. And then this is the vagina dentata rug. And I wanted to thank Barbara Teller Ornelis and Linda Teller Pete, who are fifth generation master Navajo weavers who taught me to weave in Navajo style. I, of course, I'm not Navajo, but I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to take many workshops from these two master weavers who also have a book called The Spider Women's Children, Navajo Weavers Today. I'm grateful for their friendship, and I hope I honor them and their family with these weavings for my production dissertation. I had the vagina dentata in mind when I wove this, and for the center of the vulvic-shaped figure, I used diamonds and triangles to suggest the abyss, as well as the teeth of the vagina. I chose reds uh, for the label folds, and I emphasized the danger with the jagged border on the outside of the rug. And then this rug is the Anima Mundi, which suggests the Anima Mundi or world soul, which corresponds with the Hecate card. And it was inspired by the, I've always been uh, fascinated with the Navajo Ye or supernatural beings. She wears a white dress, symbolic of uh, powerful light and rainbows as, and life force energy. She holds her arms up like a tree goddess. She bestows the beneficent blessings of fertility and rain which falls from her skirt as she spins, which is a fertility motif found in tales from all over the world. She has a pillar of diamonds that suggests the uh, chakra is going up the center of her dress and her spine. The triangular and arrow figures on either side of her represent plants. And I made her eyes the green of the Kundalini serpent, which represents the female and male serpents that spiral together, spiral together as the cosmic motion of life in the DNA. And I made her skin dark in honor of the fertile earth that, that sustains us all and the decomposition of death that equals life. And I put some little bits of sparkly, but it's hard to see it in this picture. But I wanted to symbolize her numinosity. And the white diamonds above her represent the white diamond is the pole star or the axis mundi that guides our way. And the white diamond at her feet is called the Earth Star Chakra. The other diamonds in the four corners represent the moon and sun, as well as the four directions of wholeness. And I believe that the powerful female images are needed in our world to rebalance the male and female energies in this world. And then this is another I did of Hecate, and this is in pastel and was inspired by the research on the symbols of Hecate. I used this image of a dead baby bird I found on a sidewalk. It uh, rests on her roots and is embraced by her, you know, as it dies. But birds also suggest goddesses and was used for symbolizing many alchemical processes. And then on her head, I wanted to kind of depict her head. And I was seeing like the main ad with her head thrown back. We see on like Greek vases in ecstasy rather than the triple-headed depiction of Hecate. And I wanted the background to suggest her 
realms of sky earth and underworld rather than just relegate her to the demonic underworld as she is in later mythologies i envisioned her menstruation flowing from her vagina during the art process it transformed into a labyrinth so i thought it was kind of cool and then this i wove chapter seven was about medusa in the batoni card and i wove the tapestry on the left of medusa's medusa's head with the Caput Algol star for the eye, I used a twining method for the green hair and face that gave it a texture that contrasts with the smooth plain weave of the eye and the Caput Algol eye star. And when I finished, I thought it would make a perfect kibbisis, the ritual collection bag that Perseus puts Medusa's head into. I wove the backside of the bag, which features the eye of the owl within the shape of a star. And the rays were con and connect from the front of the bag to the back of the bag. When I was in my backyard, when I was weaving this, I encountered a gopher snake, which imitates the rattlesnake head shape as a defense mechanism. So sometimes it's hard to tell if it's a rattler or a gopher snake, which unfortunately can become their downfall. And it made me think of Medusa and how she similarly gets a bad reputation for being evil and gets decapitated. And also the neck. It seemed synchronistic to me that I used three braids of red yarn from her neck to represent the blood squirting from her neck. Before I read from Eileen Brennan Root's dissertation, Redeeming the Gorgon, Reclaiming the Medusa Function of Psyche. And she says, there is a precedent in Buddhist and Hindu mythology of the powerful goddesses beheading themselves. Tantric severed head Vajra Yogini and Indic Chinamasta, a fierce aspect of Hindu Shakti, both sever their own heads with a sickle knife like that used by Perseus against Medusa. In common iconography, each holds her severed head while three jets of blood spurt out. Two streams nourish Yogini, shamanic female followers, while the third stream is swallowed by the goddess. In this mythology, the self-severing of the head nourishes the goddess and her followers. And then I decorated this bag. So this bag, I sewed it and lined it. And then I decorated it with some amazing giant cowrie shells that I found from a bead seller at a powwow in Oxnard, California. The shells symbolize the female genitals. I also used evil eye averting glass beads, as well as some Raku fired ceramic beads that I make. Then we have this. And I had a dream about... <laughs> something about me setting the table and never even thought about this artwork but now now it's kind of coming back to me like wow this dream kind of goes with this art piece but i uh, used a deconstructed cookbook to create this vagina dentata piece and i juxtaposed the fierce female with the domestic expectations of women and the motto of being sweet that supposedly defines what it is to be feminine and is used to indoctrinate young girls into being passive. I also included words for sweet food items. And I, we must realize in our remembering of the dismembered divine female image that too much sweetness can erode the teeth. <laughs> <laughs> in Goddesses and Monsters, Women, Myth, Power, and Popular Culture, Jane Caputi suggests, patriarchal good girls are associated with niceness and all around impotence, toothlessness. The bad girl or femme fatale is the always dangerous abyss, the black hole in the vagina datata, the one that still has some bite. The femme fatale, witch or vamp represents an outlawed form of female divinity, potency, genius, sexual agency, independence, vengeance, and death power. In the center of the mouth is a diagram of how to set the table, which is a small nod to the dinner party, a feminist art piece by Judy Chicago. And I chose words that were metaphors also for male and female genitals, such as doubled clams or meatballs. And I also chose words that pertain to various stages of a woman's life. In this oil cookbook was really interesting because it included ads for tonics targeted at women to relieve their various perceived pathologies, such as menstruation, menopause. These tonics replace the empowering sacred saffron tonics that women once used. I added serpents in the two corners of the piece because the serpents associated with the powerful as well as the demonized female image. And this next work I call the eye and blood tapestry, although I did 
this same tapestry in different colors. This tapestry was woven with the idea of the power of the female seer associated with the red liquids of the entheogens and the menstrual blood that's both life and death every month. I used variegated red wool for the textured red background. I used silk for the white and dark part of the eye to make it shiny and to provide contrast. And I used variegated serpentine green for the iris. I heard a speaker who compared the goddess Kali with Satan and Darth Vader. And I suggested that the goddess Kali is not evil, but represents both life and death. And that Kali is not evil unless you also believe that death is also evil. So that was kind of an interesting series that I did on these in this tapestry with eyes that kind of went together with my whole dissertation and the evil eye and the, the spearing the evil eye of the female. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Okay. Thank you. I, I've gotten off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you, Lisa, for that really powerful and potent presentation. Before we get into some of the q and I want to clarify a few things for people who may not know. And that is you talk a few times in your presentation and in your dissertation about the right hand and the left hand. In a lot of traditions, the right hand is masculine energy and the left hand represents feminine energy. Yeah. And I think it kind of goes along with like, positive right positive All right. right yes and the right, the left hand was considered evil right so if the left hand is female it's considered evil right exactly and then the other thing that i think is really important that i want people to get is like this concept of entheogens yeah. theo means that's the masculine word meaning yeah. god and yeah. so lisa as far as we know right you coined this term and theogens to give it the female version yes. of goddess so you're finding, you're feminizing this idea of the feminine spirit within these plant yeah. medicines, these plant spirits yeah. and theogens. So anybody out there, if you hear that term, you have to quote Lisa, but it's, it's about finding the feminine energy and the feminine life force within these sacred plants, not just this masculine energy, but there's feminine energy in plants too. Yes. Yeah. But it's always that the whole thing about mankind throwing the female it's oh it includes them you know yeah yeah it's the the language that makes women automatically secondary why did you choose to analyze the solo busca tarot because it was one of the oldest complete decks and there must be a reason why there was only six cards that referenced the female and as i delved into it it became much more deep and complicated as you could tell by the talk that I just gave. Right. And I like the fact that some of this Rider Waits images came from the Solabuska. Right. Because I found it interesting. I don't know much about tarot, but I'm more familiar with the Rider Waite Smith tarot. So I was like, wow, there's no priestess card in the Solabuska deck. Like, that's weird. There's only the queens. Yeah. And but then, then the look at Hecate. Hecate has the veil. You know, she has the veil between the worlds. When I first saw her, I thought this is like the world card and she has the veil of the priestess evolved i think into more esoteric imagery and more females got brought in like in this card we have the star but the star is evil you know it's the eye that must be stabbed by the spear but then in the writer wade smith we have the star who's empowering feminine but she's also naked you know and she dips her foot into the water of life you know, so we have this more empowering, maybe as our sensibilities get more inclusive of the female, but it's still the original text is still a misogynistic men having power over other men and women and anyone who doesn't look like them that we see now. Right. We've right. kind of weaved in and out of this throughout your presentation and a little bit now in this Q&A, but I really want to emphasize that as we're delving into the tarot, and this Sola Busca Tarot specifically, and we're really kind of investigating, what you've really done is investigated, gone beyond the surface imagery and beyond the surface symbolism to point out that behind these images, there's three major themes that I'm seeing come up, right? One is the usurpation, the devaluation, and the demonization of these mythic historic female figures and female symbolisms. 
Also, second, tarot as an alchemical journey in which the feminine is both a necessary tool, but also an obstacle. And you reiterate that, right? Like our womb is still necessary. But it must be controlled. Like right now, we have Roe v. Wade being overthrown. And why is that? No, anyone who thinks we live in a post-feminist world, we don't. And these texts run so deep inside us and underneath in these subtle messages I mean, why do we, so many women have issues with feeling like an imposter? Mm-hmm. And or, why do yeah. women have a hard time asking for what they needed to be equal pay? If you've been taught in very subtle ways that you're not as good as a man, it's self-sabotage. You're self-sabotaging yourself because that's the story you've gotten all along. And even in these texts that maybe you don't you know, it's so unconscious. Well, sometimes you don't stop and examine it. You know, And the other thing is like, we live in a culture where everything is associated with men is valued more than what's associated with women. So like everything that's based in culture that men have traditionally been able to do, have more access to than women, that scene is better and more valuable than everything that's associated with women, like our bodies, nature, mm-hmm. matter. So part of the problem is that our whole value system is skewed and and screwed yeah. up instead of totally integrating everything so that men and women are both equally associated with both of these things and have access to both. Yeah. Men are shamed for being empathetic. They're shamed for being uh, nurturing. They're shamed, you know, right. so men suffer always having to be the hyper, hyper masculine or they're attacked Creating. or they're called a pussy In other words, they're being called, you must be a woman. You must be the flawed. Because pussy is associated with weak. Yeah. Your base matter. You don't matter. Women don't matter. And if you're not a man who beats other men, shames them, then you don't matter either. That's that's really interesting. And remember that like in Latin, mater means mother, mother. right? And it's associated with matter. The other major theme that I found in your work is that many of these female figures also have something to do with these entheogens, which you didn't talk much about in your presentation because it's a whole other layer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but, but the- you know, we have the Maynards and the Bacantes. They were the priestesses, and the priestesses were mixing the herbal stuff. And, and then even in our Indo European different mythologies, you know, the mushroom was very important. A lot of scholars believe that entheogens were used in religion and yeah. it's just suppressed. It's, you know, we don't want these people out there all doing drugs. Even in the, you know? even in the Christian religion. you've, you've Early Christianity. That. Early Christianity. Once you open your eyes, once you start looking at that, you can't close your eyes again. Like it's, That's right. It's there and you see the symbolism and you're like, oh, this is what they're talking about. Kind of like feminism. Once you learn feminism, you can't unsee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the premise that I stepped into this conversation with is if the Sola Busca deck is sexist, which from your work, I've seen that it's sexist. Why is knowing that relevant? If we don't respect the female goddess, we're not going to respect women. It's about representation, right? It's representation matters, having empowering images. It's the subtle things that have these ancient roots, but, but the life religions and the cyclical calendars go tens of thousands of years back whereas this is relatively new and yet it's still playing us i guess the question is we know there's these powerful women and goddesses in this deck but the way that they're represented is disempowering how do we redeem it how do we keep playing tarot in a way so that we feel empowered i mean it does have its purposes but just understand where it came from understand the root of the tarot right as being this text and understand that these texts were based on misogynistic ideals philosophies and religions and you know it was about power it was about having power over you can still use it but are you going to rewrite the entire text so it would have to be almost like a recreation of everything. Which is possible. But, and that's but would you be able to call it tarot anymore? I don't know. You know. Right. And maybe this is the advice I would give, though. As readers know, if you just keep practicing the tarot, that you end up creating your own symbolism, just as like a psychic would come up with their own symbols for, for meanings of things. But just keep in mind the roots. Keep in mind the ancient roots of, of the texts. 
that are playing in the behind the scenes that have put us where we are now. We have the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women has not been ratified by the United States. Now the stenchy Supreme Court's trying to overturn Roe v. Wade. I mean, these it's right. just continuing. These I mean, are based on really old sexist, I, disempowering ideas about women, right? Yes. But it goes back thousands of years and those yeah. same ideas and thoughts end up in the tarot. Yeah, I think that many people have tried to make the tarot more inclusive and they did succeed. But just to keep in mind, ultimately, the basic structure of it is like patriarchal and misogynist. And we'll just continue to try to redeem it and make it better. Make it better. Yeah. I mean- we talked about Vicki Noble at some point and you and I both took a class with Vicki Noble and yeah. we have the mother piece tarot deck and it is, it's, they've done a pretty good job of creating an empowering. I think she, deck. Yeah. She kind of goes back to the shamanistic roots, but even and shamans, you know, shamans were women. They weren't mm -hmm. just men, but people have this idea because of the male scholars that all shamans were men and they weren't so are your works for sale yes everything's for sale i do have a website lisaarscura.com and my email is lisaarscura at lisaarscura.com so my website's in progress excellent i wanted to see if you could pull a card mm. from the solabusca deck and kind of frame the energy for our talk today pull one okay what am i gonna pull ah bacho it's the 14th card, Solabusca, shifting alliances, reverse to side jumping. And then it's the temperance card of the rider weight. So that would make sense. Like we need to share. We need to share the power, the quality, the temperance, the balance, life, go the middle way. Balance, right. And balancing, yeah. like hearing different multiple perspectives, having conversations instead of acting accusing people <laughs> or attacking people but really specifically with our talk it really is about balancing the feminine with the masculine right yes i think that's a good place to leave this then thank you everybody for being here thank you lisa so much i'm so thank grateful you. and if you like what you saw today then please hit like please share this video, please leave a comment, ask questions. If you ask questions, I will direct them to Lisa and get her to respond. If you want to support this channel, a great way to do that would be to join my Patreon. I'd like to kind of on the side, call it Matreon. <laughs> <laughs> If you're a woman, you can be a matron. <laughs> That's right. Not just a patron, but it's all different, uh, all different monthly amounts starting at $3, which I call the triple goddess donation amount. Thank you again, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Ciao.